Let's run through a few basic facts here. We know this is Adrian Brenop. Here, 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 here. I mean, yeah, here. These are all sound bites from the Nightcap on Minjimble official video. So, yes, he makes sure. It's funny that this video here, right? I actually listen to it. It's all Dean Rodimer speaking. It just turns around and flashes to AB nodding his head for a couple of seconds and then back to Dean. And yeah, they use that as the th as a thumbnail because AB has to put himself out there in the front as the developer. Now, I'm going to try and get through a few basic facts here. Now, over here on the other side, we've got Adrian Brannock's bankruptcy. It was officially, the Statement of Affairs was filed on the 17th of September 2018. This individual is an undischarged bankrupt and that as is of yesterday, 10 a.m. on the 11th of December, 2020. So this is very current information. Interesting to note too, he's got himself down his occupation. Well, he, I thought he was a plumber actually. Then he became, well, he became lots of things, didn't he? But... Obviously, he's a commercial property operator and developer. And it's interesting, why would he call himself commercial property operators? That's more than one interesting definition, isn't it? So, according to that, from the 17th of September 2018 to one day and well, three years and one day after that date, he will be automatically discharged unless there is a petition to the court to extend the bankruptcy or Adrian Brennock could petition the court to have it reduced. But that would take extraordinary circumstances to actually get it reduced. Now, here on this page, we have the Corporations Act 2001, Part 2D.6, Disqualification from Managing Corporations. Now, I've highlighted 206B because that's the part that automatic disqualification for convictions, bankruptcy and foreign court orders, etc. There's a little bit more of a description on page 348 but that's pretty much the summary that's all we need to go to at this stage we look over here Adrian Brennock is a bankrupt he is automatically disqualified go to 206a disqualified persons do not manage corporations all right not to manage corporations okay so Adrian Brennock might like to turn around and say, well, I'm not managing a corporation, I'm not a director and I'm not a shareholder, so I'm not. Well, the thing is that I've managed a shop and a department and all these other things and it does not mean that I'm a director or a shareholder. You can still manage corporations or business affairs uh, in the capacity of managing these things because there's very strict guidelines laid down um, if you wanted to borrow $500 first you've got to go to the person well first of all you've got to go to your trustee who manages all your affairs get his permission to do that then you'd have to go to the person that you wanted to borrow the 500 bucks off say, I'm an undisqualified bankrupt, would you lend me $500, please? Every There's a reason that a bankrupt has a trustee. It's to actually monitor and administer 
their affairs. So in essence, you could say that the trustee has power of attorney over Adrian Brannock's affairs. It's not uh, what you'd call a complete power of attorney because there is still the ability of that person to act in their own ability but only with the permission and with the knowledge and direction of the trustee and that all parties involved know that he is an undischarged bankrupt. Now this here is part of the planet uh, PDF that's previously been uploaded. It's 60 odd pages long. And it was completed in May 2019. Now this uh, was actually what was submitted to the court. One thing I did notice on here that one page throughout of it was actually signed and that actually came out of a DA, the old DA that they extracted some of this information for that is part of Peter Van Leishout's land at the moment. Now, I've just got to the bottom of what was submitted to the court and here Adrian Brennock is signing on behalf of Lumban Horizons sole director to actually uh, produce the planet document and the planet document is actually dated it was first drafted in May 2019 and it was also completed a few days later so after his bankruptcy Adrian Brannock has represented himself as the sole director of Wollumbin Horizons but he wasn't Oops, let's just get rid of that, sorry. I did click the wrong button and I lost all my PDFs. <laughs> Alright, so here is the X, well it's a pretty much a, pr a print PDF of what I did when I used um, Creditors Watch. But it, it's giving the same information. It's not so easy to actually get a search done uh, through a place like Creditors Watch or a company extract because they only have extracts that people have previously paid for. So every time someone actually pays ATSIC for an extract, that extract then becomes available to all these credit reporting agencies and whatever that then charge for them. So every time you see that there's an available extract, that's because someone actually paid to get it done for whatever reason. I mean, there might be someone doing a creditor's check on them and that's a standard thing to do for a company is to find out who the current owners are. So, And that's also, too, why you can get a lot of current searches. They're not interested in who used to be involved. They just want to know the current situation. So back in um, 2017, in on the 8th of August, Stephen Neville Starts, the liquidator, was appointed as the office holder. So essentially any directorships don't exist anymore. He is now the office holder for the company in liquidation. The company will be wound down and one day it'll be, you know, <laughs> all tied up and nobody will be interested in it anymore and I'll tell you what that'll be a day for many to to welcome <laughs> it's been a drawn out nightmare for many so in 2019 when the planet draft was presented uh, it was using the authority that Adrian Brennock signed as the director of Wollumbin Horizons and he hasn't been that since um, well, actually, it was a little bit before then because this is the appointment date of the liquidator. Before that, he was appointed for oh, a couple of weeks, a month, I think, uh, as an administrator. Now, the administrator 
then decides, no, we can't do anything, so it goes into liquidation. And in this case, it's a voluntary wind-up. As opposed to an involuntary wind-up where your creditors force you into um, wind-up. So, yeah, if people didn't know the difference. So, pay attention to the date in August 2017. Then have a look at this here, which is up, uh, done in June uh, hang on. Yes, it's uh, June 2017. So, quite literally, weeks before uh, Stephen Starts was a appointed administrator, um, not liquidator, but administrator, Adrian Brennock, on behalf of the mortgagee, and up here you can see AB, rainmakereco.com.au, organising with the mortgagee, Phil, which is Phil Dixon, again at rainmakereco.com.au for $1.225 million. So this was within weeks of the um, company being put into administration and saying there was no money left. Now the loan document itself is signed by people that are all part of the Wollumbin Horizons community. Uh, here we've got Adrian Brennock who's the director Cherie Stokes, who's the witness, <laughs> Martin Madron, who's the director of Mount Warning Eco Village, that is now Nightcap um, N <laughs> Hang on. NCV Enterprises. Uh, so, and then over here we've got the director of that, also Philip John Dixon. Now, as the director, Philip John Dixon also started action against Julia Norman. And that is not me either. <laughs> if people haven't figured out I'm living in Tassie and I'm not even on the mainland, well, yeah, sidebar there. <laughs> so you can see that back in 2017, Adrian Brannock, Sheree Stokes, Martin Madron and Philip Dixon are all signing on paper. And it's interesting to note that when they start um, peeling back the activities of Wollumbin Horizons when they go to court with the liquidator, uh, it seems like Mark Darwin is blamed for everything. So I think that's why... Um, he probably stood up in court and said what he did about the accusation against the liquidator and Adrian Brennock having private meetings. And this is Mark Darwin's, what he apparently said, not my words, that uh, they stacked the creditors. Now, there's been a lot of attempts made to actually try and find out what is going on with the liquidator but you know he doesn't like talking to people unless you're involved with it he doesn't seem to think that he needs to justify his actions to anybody let alone the fact that he is highly governed by this in fact if you look up the bankruptcy act and you look for disqualifications there are actually more disqualifications against trustees than there are individual people. Because when you act in the capacity of trustee, you actually have to be pretty much the letter of the law. You know, you have got to be doing everything right. You are dealing with other people's affairs. It's very important you deal with them properly and legally. 
Now the interesting point to bring up about this little loan agreement is that essentially the money is all coming from the same place. It's all the same investor's money. So how can there be any loan agreement between the different members when in actual fact, um, well, kind of, what's Wollumbin Horizons is Mount Warning Eco Village because they're all controlled by the members. So you wouldn't need to make a loan. These are all just um, outwardly controlling elements for the trust and the people behind it or the members. So ultimately you just use a different well you do what uh, wall did you know uh, rothwell wall you just take the money from one account and you stick it into the other one because it's all the same members money making a loan to yourself is well that's essentially what this loan agreement is making a loan to yourself except this self is representative of members you know they're lending money back to themselves it, it's it's a stupid concept it's a highly ridiculous one and also this loan agreement was never lodged at ATSIC because any charge that goes against a company has to be lodged and it'll be interesting to know what the liquidator knows about this loan agreement whether Apparently, um, Mount Warning Eco Village, now trading as NCV Enterprises, who is actually now the person who just bought through Triple Two. Um, yeah, sorry, I've just lost myself because it all seems to be the same people. Oh, because that's because it is. <laughs> And then there's this curious little document which was supposed to go with the loan but it doesn't seem to match up because um, well for one on here even though the purchaser is Mount Warning Eco Village um, well they're going to purchase something for 4.2 million dollars and they just lent 1.2 to themselves. Wow, that's $5.4 million that they're wanting to fork out just weeks before Wollumbin Horizons is, um, well, according to... Oh, sorry, I've got that there again. Hang on. According to Adrian Brennock's own Vox that uh, yeah they they did it deliberately and it's no surprise that it's come back to the very same members that sold it but this uh, purchase agreement here is not related to the agreement the loan agreement in any way that can actually be identified because here you even look at, see they want 365 days after the date of this contract for the com date of completion. And the land is just simply described as Nightcap Village, Kyogle Road, Kunga, New South Wales, C Attachment A. So this is Appendix A. And on here we've got title numbers that are fairly hard to read I know but essentially that is let's go over to this one that you can read essentially it is lot 20 which is split up into two sections and lot 2 so it's all 3222 Kyogle Road So what they're saying in Appendix A is that all this land at 3222, let's go to the, back to the purchase agreement, is 4.2 million. 
but I thought they only paid one something million for it. I mean, it was sold for a little over a million dollars. So it doesn't make sense that... Oops, hang on, that's the other one. Wrong one, hang on. Okay, so here we are back at the loan agreement that Appendix A is supposed to attach to, which is for 3222. And you look at the loan agreement, and that's for uh, apparently 1.2. Now, I don't understand, you know, maybe I'm missing a point here, but how do they go from 1.2? And the thing being, too, is that why would they even need to borrow that much? Or is, I mean, is that kind of like an evaluation of the land? Because there was apparently a loan taken out for 500000 or 550 I can't remember quite which right now, but um, investors had paid for the bulk of it. And so why would they need a loan? But this isn't the loan that they took out to actually purchase the land with or finish paying the land off with. It's already been purchased, this one's on top of it. So, uh, it, it, as I say, it kind of gets confusing. It doesn't actually look like, uh, well, this doesn't actually look like it belongs to that loan contract. The dollar values are different for a start. And uh, it doesn't make sense that Mount Warning Eco Village are lending Wollumbin Horizons the money to buy whatever, well, apparently, it, for something. <laughs> and now Mount Eco Village are now buying off Zimmerland, who is Peter Van Leishout, the land that is three triple two. As we saw from Appendix A, it is the land that is 3222 and that wasn't actually owned by Peter Van Leishout. So the land that's stated in Attachment A is not the property of the claimed vendor, Zimmerland. And I have done a company extract on Zimmerland. I know it's 100% Peter Van Leishout. So if you do look at attachment A, it shows you lots that belong to an address that are not the property of Peter Van Leishout. So as I say, it is really confusing you could say that this contract for sale is completely different and that the attachment A that they refer to is not the attachment A in the mortgage document. Because how can a Zimmerland sell what's in attachment A, which is 3222, when that land doesn't belong to him. Yes, you can see my confusion, can't you? <laughs> but this is what you have to use when you get provided with information and people don't know the context in which it should actually go because documents should match up. I should be looking at a dollar value down here. If it was to be even n not drawing any attention, the dollar values should be the same to begin with so that you could easily just go, yes, that looks right, that looks right. But the dollar value for a start. And at the same time, Mount Warning Eco Village are lending Wollumbin Horizons 1.2 million. They're offering to buy 
the same land that doesn't belong to Zimmerland off Zimmerland for $4.2 million. This is all happening in June 2017. So if all of these documents were actually together and presented as a complete contract and a contract for sale, I'd have to say that what you've got is oh, a very, very bad contract. One that, well, as you just saw, I explained to you, you look at attachment A, you look at the lots, they belong to 3222. 3222 was actually bought from a deceased estate and it was not Peter Van Lyshout who bought that. The people that were there were there for a long time and Peter Van Lyshout has never had anything to do with 3222. So if you do use append attachment A, then it describes 3222. Now the vendor, the person that is selling it, has to own the land to sell it. So what I'm saying is that this contract cannot be for 3222. This contract must be for land that belongs to Peter Van Lyshout and the going price $4.2 million. Now, I haven't seen any documentation. Of course, it would be very difficult to see it. So this is unsubstantiated. That that 365 days, $4.2 million wasn't handed over. So basically, uh, it looks like that a new contract was renegotiated. And the price went from 14 point, sorry, 4.2 to 14 million. Now, it seems, and this is all only um, heard it on the grapevine, <laughs> it's, uh, it's surmising. So after this renegotiation of this new contract for a much more substantial dollar value, there has been the inability of the representative of the purchaser, which would now be NCV Enterprises, to come up with $14 million. So essentially, uh, I think what we heard on the Voxes was a description of how AB would tie Peter Van Lyshout up in court if he complained about the fact that they weren't forking over the $14 million. They intend to, to give him a certain dollar value as a promissory, you know, well, we'll do it. And in that way, he keeps, well, that sort of con going. You know, it's, he keeps Peter Van Lysch out and his land tied in, and he keeps investors coming in, with money so that they can then go off and buy other bits of land and do all the other stuff. And with the sale of 3222 now and the money in the liquidator's hands, it's planned. Well, I'll tell you what, it'll be interesting to see. Does the liquidator use um, a more equitable balance to creditors? rather than what Mark Darwin accused him of. I certainly hope that what Mark Darwin said was wrong and that Stephen Starts will do the right thing because he's not the only trustee in, that's involved around Adrian Brennock. Adrian Brennock's got a trustee for his bankruptcy and even the Corporations Act looks at treating a company in liquidation the same as you do a bankrupt. So essentially, you've got the bankrupt trustee for the company who's the liquidator and the bankrupt trustee who's 
the trustee for Adrian Bronock. And they, the company that he bankrupted, Wollumbin Horizons, was solely all in his name, director, shares and everything, when he put it into the fire sale, as he says in the Vox. So I've shown you that uh, bankrupts, I mean, it's clearly stated in the law, and I'm only showing you one particular section of the uh, Corporations Act. I can go to the Bankruptcies Act and I can also bring up searches of Nyepi and other companies to show the movement of shares by this Adrian Brunock that's a bankrupt that moved his shares to avoid having them seized during bankruptcy. And the fact that he actually did that uh, is quite a few different breaches. And because he did that, that would necessitate the lie of making false statements, false declarations to the court. And, uh, you know, that brings in other penalties because I don't actually know whether he testified and spoke that day in court in that hearing. But if he did, well, that's perjury. And that's not very nice. But at the very minimum, it's contempt of court. And that's too... <laughs> hey, I was watching a video of Mark Darwin's where he said that if people don't get the process right, they can um, get contempt of court. And they actually knew a guy that was doing 28 days because he got contempt of court because he kept interrupting the judge. Hmm. Yeah, they don't really advertise the um, bad side of it, but that's the whole point of sales and promotions. You don't give out all the flaws, do you? So let's review another bankrupt that I introduced you to just recently, Rodney Norman Culleton, or Colton, whatever he wants to, however he wants to pronounce it, uh, from the Great Australia Party. As described here, as of the 26th of September, he was also an undischarged bankrupt. And uh, that's not actually looking good because if you look at the date when it was entered, it was back in 2016. It's three years and one day past then. It's a little bit uh, difficult to know what's actually gone on with this because there's no statement of fares filed date. And, uh, I mean, he's registered as a bankrupt and he's also stated as an undischarged bankrupt. So the fact that he's still stated that in 2020, um, almost a year after he would have been... Um, automatically discharged means that there must have been someone make an objection because that's also a very big part in the Bankruptcy Act. It allows for people to make objections on all different sides for all different reasons. So I've been giving some ponderings to um, Mark McMurtry's gone a little bit quiet and uh, you know, thank you to people who do send me links. You know, it's the only reason that I can share these things and actually try and piece together all this stuff because, you know, Mark McMurtry or Banyini Nyini has been trolling me for a bit and then he goes all quiet. And it's like, why has he been going quiet? Well, and the reason I bring up uh, Rodney is because... Mark McMurtry being um, head of the convener or convener of the OSTF uh, has just signed up with Rodney Colton and Max Egan has been promoting Ricardo Bosi and well Ricardo Bosi is going for lawful rebellion they are aiming to get enough people 
through the voting system to go for a lawful rebellion. So yes, why has Mark McMurtry been quiet? Well, they put out a blog on the OSTF. Um, let me read it. Poor Mark. <laughs> Mark has been labelled many things by media, independent bloggers and even tribal, nation, um, tribal nations individuals who either have an agenda, hold previous grudges or simply have different views. Mark comes across as a straightforward man, wow, I'm nearly choking on these words, <laughs> which can uh, many times be taken the wrong way. And social media is great for that. However, Mark is a good man oh, with an honest stance for tribal nations' freedom. Oh, yeah, it's hard to read this out, sorry. <laughs> I'll try and do it justice. Who has dedicated his life to this fight. Mark knows very well that he would be in serious trouble if he was deliberately out to deceive and sell out the tribal nations. Wow, that's an unusual thing to come out with, isn't it? He knows very well that he would be in serious trouble if he was deliberately out to deceive them. What if he accidentally did and could never deliver on anything he promised? Hmm. Interesting choice of description. Mark has been resting from having to defend himself from the many, it seems, desperate attacks to discredit his name and also the strain it has caused his family. He has always been open to conversation and has reaffirmed this recently. <laughs> yeah, he's about as open to conversation as Max Egan. Unless you're one of their yes men, they don't want to know you. If you're asking them questions, the first thing they're going to do is come at you like they know it all, you know nothing, call you a bunch of names and yeah. I mean, you know that I know so many people that have got screenshots of you, Mark McMurtry, Adrian Brunock, all of your little comments. It's not just, you know, how I could do a dick of the year for Adrian Brannock and others because of the things you've said this year. I mean, these are a long collection. You know, you've had a lot of years where you've been well, thinking you're ten foot tall and bulletproof. Confusion about the OSTF. Sellouts. There has been a lot of confusion and gossip about what the OSTF has done lately and is doing today. Of course, the OSTF is still fighting for our true freedom. However, many of our members still have family business to attend to, families, um, family working in mainstream and meetings happening for the community, etc., e.g. native title. Many community members have already put in native title determination years ago whether anyone ever gave consent at the time or not. That's also another interesting thing, isn't it? Many have put in determinations years ago whether everyone gave consent at the time or not. So... Mark McMurtry is saying that all these claims have been put in on native title without people's, with or without people's consent. Do, do you just not see that? Whether everyone gave consent at the time or not. So even those that didn't consent had native title determinations put in yes years ago yeah well that's uh that's free will isn't it even for people that don't consent you're going to do it okay so let's continue the tribal nations are watching out for country harder than ever right now 
there are more internal disagreements happening too. Yeah, and that's largely due to Mark McMurtry. Now let me just sidetrack here for a second. Back in 2012, Michael Anderson is already making, you know, he's putting two and two together about Mark McMurtry. The people that he's associated with, especially this Jerry Pruss, um, Butzowitz, I'd not, yeah, he's horrible last name. Um, his association with the Crown cr Prosecutors, also his association with, uh, is it in this one? Uh, hang on. Yeah, uh, his other confidant is the Knight of the British Commonwealth, Sir John Walsh of Branagh. And uh, Jerry Pruss is a member of the Lincoln's Inn in Lum London. I don't know, I suppose that's supposed to be an important place. I don't actually know what it is. To me, it actually sounds like accommodation, but it must be fairly exclusive. <laughs> must be one of those boys' clubs. Anyway. Back in 2012, Michael Anderson is already saying uh, very clearly that he believes that uh, all the infighting that Mark McMurtry is causing, it actually seems like he is deliberately trying to uh, sabotage their efforts and cause division, and he's he can't understand why. Now, another interesting sidetrack, and I'm going to do a couple of them before I get back to the other point, is what he says about the OSTF and how it been led by Mark, who was the whistleblower on pedophilia in northern in New South Wales when he made a number of allegations. Mr McMurtry's advice to the former State Member of Parliament, Franca Arena, saw her raise the allegations in State Parliament of New South Wales. Mr McMurtry failed to back up the allegations with cre credible evidence. As a consequence of this, Mr McMurtry lost everything he ever owned and was publicly disgraced. I am afraid that Mr McMurtry is now using the Aboriginal sovereignty movement to carry out a personal vendetta against the whole of the Australian state. And I'd say that Michael Anderson has got fair reason to state that he does have a grudge against the Crown and against the government and a vendetta. And he is trying to get this sovereignty movement and everything going that he's in charge of so that he's got the power and the numbers behind him so that when he goes into the court and he goes into the government, he's going to beat them this time. And ultimately, I think that uh, basically sovereignty is no more than a tool for him. It is a rainmaker technique to tap into non-traditional markets. And the promise of sovereignty is going to happen if we keep giving money into it and we keep supporting the efforts of those that are working hard to get it, you know, well, we'll get there. we just got to keep it in there, you know, and keep in those donations coming in. Uh, the more people help, the, the, the more we can advance with the legal team and everything. I mean, the legal team wouldn't have done anything different in the last five years. I'd say they've exhausted every option that they possibly can years ago. So it's not like they're going to suddenly come across something that they haven't discovered before. Now, this is another um, article by Michael in 2017. Now, I'll just bring up... And I will leave links for these articles so you can read them in full because it actually does give a much better description of Mark McMurtry's full involvement and how his involvement is corrupting um, any attempts uh, from the inside out. And the reason I'm bringing up a lot of these issues is because, well... Uh, yeah, I've got another article to show you, but 
you know, if you might actually believe that someone like the sovereignty movement for Aboriginal Australia actually created some kind of threat at some kind of level, you may well understand why they may send in someone to create a controlled opposition to it, which is really what OSTFs has seemed to have been to everything that the legitimate tribal nations have tried to achieve. But uh, my point here is more about how a supporter of this group is now very wary of them because, as he alleged, Mark McMurtry carries an Australian Federal Police identification, which apparently the supporter said he saw in McMurtry's wallet. Now, a little bit further down here, he goes on to say, McMurtry admitted to Aboriginal people in Alice Springs that he reports to the police station where he goes to a regional area. Now, you could say, yes, knowing Mark McMurtry, he'd probably go in and say, oh, you know, I'm King McMurtry, I'm here to put you on notice. If you don't behave, I'm going to come and, you know, you're on our country now. <laughs> or maybe he is carrying some kind of identification. Maybe he is some kind of an undercover, an infiltrator, a plant, uh, whatever. It's already been put out there by those that have been around him. And I mean, uh, I'd... I'd believe it without even um, being around him, but to be around someone, to see how they behave, uh, what they do, and to be in the know too. So the question about Mark McMurtry and his involvement with anything that might be considered undercover, infiltrator, whatever. I mean, people might think that's a li little bit ludicrous, but, um, well, I'll read this out in a sec. But when you look at um, some of the comments that I've been left and the talk about how do I know Deborah Bentley? It's like, no... Well, uh, apparently she is, and I'm reading from what the comment says, comment says, not me. Apparently she is a police informant, a registered police informant, and she's really good mates with Mark McMurtry. So this is another thing that comes up, and it's like, well, you know, it's possible. I mean... A narc's a narc, you know, a narc is pretty much anyone that will be your friend to your face and stab you in the back and sell you out behind your back, betray your confidences and your trusts. You know, I don't, they don't necessarily actually have to be sent in there for, you know, specific reasons. But So I was then sent this link that is six days ago. British women thought they'd found boyfriends who shared their beliefs. They were actually undercover police. Two years ago, Queensland woman Ellie got a phone call that changed her life. It was from her first love, a man named James. She'd met him in 2001 when she was living in London. She was just 21 and he was 33. So yeah, let's cut through all that and say they got on well, they clicked. But in 2018, he phoned her in Australia to make a startling confession. He'd been living a lie. He was an undercover police officer who had been sent to spy on her and those in her friend circle. It was basically a con, an 18-year con, she said. He was one of my oldest friends, so to find out it was a complete lie was a lot. 
So you think, all right, so you find out that she had a sexual relationship with him. They were together for a year. And then he broke it off because he said he had to go to America because his ex-wife and kids were going over there and he wanted to move there to be close to them. And every now and again over the years, she hears from him and her other friend, Wendy, that was a... that was the one that he wanted to get in because he wanted to spy on her and those in her friend circle. Her friend that they wanted to spy on was Wendy. So Wendy and Ellie had communications with James spasmodically over the years up until that point. And any time Ellie and Wendy went to England, he came for a visit. But the one and only time they went to America to visit where he said he was, and he wasn't there. And then he's actually become part of what appears to be um, uncovering, uh, because Ellie is one of at least 30 women who were tricked into having relationships with undercover officers working in London's Metropolitan Police Service. And the thing that really bothers me, I mean, taking on dead children's identity and infiltrating environmental protest groups is bad enough, but a handful fathered children with their targets. So there's over 30 women, and some of those women are clearly in Australia, um, were probably Australians that went over there on a working holiday or visa or something. I don't know. I haven't looked that far into it. But essentially, Ellie, um, at 21, I don't think she could have been a qualified vet working in an animal hospital. She was more probably a volunteer and her friend Wendy was organising protests for the fox hunts. So... They were pretty much out there protesting over the fox hunting. So this was um, something to stop cruelty to animals. This is not a political activist or extremist movement. It was interesting to note, I saw Max Egan leave a comment the other day, where he, like um, the Anarchapalco that they all go to now instead of Freedom Summits, is... Um, they call themselves anarchists. And Max Egan commented and said, anarchy is good because that means self-governance. And it's like, um, actually, I thought anarchy meant no governance. I mean, I thought anarchy means out of control. And I can't help it, you know, every time I think of anarchy, I think of Sid Vicious and the, the Sex Pistols and... You know, if you want to know <laughs> what that means, <laughs> an anarchist, yeah, out of control. And look where that that ended up. Oh, that's a bad story. I ended up watching the story on video of Sid and Nancy, and I tell you what, it is one of the most depressing movies I've ever watched, and I would not recommend anyone to watch it. Because by the time you finish watching it, it is not a feel-good movie. So, yeah, what is an anarchist? Someone that breaks all the rules, that doesn't have any rules, that thinks that no one should have any rules. Anarchy. Chaos. <laughs> it's not self-governance. It's no governance at all. I think any of us, any of us have seen enough spy movies, police shows and all these other things to know the basic principles, reasons why are multiple, why someone would build a false identity and infiltrate a group of people. It could be, you know, like uh, as a grifter to rip them off. It could be as an infiltrator to spy on them. It, it can be any number of reasons. So there doesn't have to be a clear-cut line that, oh, well, it couldn't be because, no. There are a lot of reasons why people want to spy on other people and why they're not truthful. 
Max Egan doesn't want anyone to know anything about who he really is. He goes out and even calls himself Max Egan in real life. You know, it's one thing to be known by a false persona to the public, but to be known by everybody? That's what you call building a false identity. And the thing is that everybody accepts that false identity from a truther. When there is no truth in the identity he's actually presenting. I've brought up the OPPT, which is, again, another sovereignty movement. Now, an interesting thing, too, at the end of Max Egan's video that he did on Zen Gardner and Ken O'Keefe, he actually talks about the OPPT, sovereignty issues, the free man issues, trust law. He says it's all bullshit. You, know, you go down all these rabbit holes and it's all bullshit. So this is in 2016, he's saying it's bullshit. And there's a good reason for that because uh, this OPPT, if you notice here, um, hang on, I'll see if I can find the... That was right at the bottom. The group's founder, Heather, currently sits in federal prison awaiting sentencing. If you go down here to look at the people that influenced her, <laughs> They're sentenced to over 12 years of prison due to his fraudulent actions involving 30 million of bad checks. He served all 12 years. This one sentenced to four years due to a jury finding that he filed two false income tax refund claims. And this guy up here, he's on the run and still on the run. <laughs> So, was it successful? Back in 2013, Max Egan was promoting the OPPT like he is all the other sovereignty pie in the sky ideas that people try and they end up in bloody jail. <laughs> you know, it's, not, uh, it's not a fairy tale ending. You know, you don't live happily ever after. It's more like, uh, you know, when you play Monopoly and you get that go to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, where it ends, in jail. 99.9% .9 of them. The other one, other 0.1% is going to fail before it gets to the stage where they attract enough attention to actually be put in jail for. And back to the uh, 4th of December and poor little Mark McMurtry's little, you know, he's been under so much pressure he's having to take a break from all the people having to go at him. Yes, here's Kylie Jerome. She's been posting a few of my links and <laughs> I'm included. Yay, I'm famous. I got me 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> That's funny. That uh, surname came up in conversations today. Sims. People that I emailed today, we were talking about someone with a surname Sims. Hmm. It's a bit of a coincidence, isn't it? Small world. Wonder if he wasn't using that tribal name, whether his name might be the first name I gave out. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, sorry, that was a sideline and for <laughs> others there. <laughs> but it comes down here where pretty much there are people, they've had a three day event, and they've had people show up and are basically saying, you know, well, we don't like the idea that it seems to be all Mark McMurtry that has got control over everything. That Mark McMurtry still had full control over everything, okay? So it's starting to come up in the communities that um, Mark McMurtry has got control over everything. And did you not just hear when I read before that he actually said that 
native title determinations were put in even if people didn't agree to it. So pretty much if you've signed something with OSTF, um, this is why I keep saying to people you need to check what you've signed with OSTF. Any out there in the tribal communities, find out from your elders. They should have a copy of the document that they signed. If not, well, tell Mark McMurtry to produce it. And if he can't, well then he's got no claim to represent them and you can tell him to piss off. So I've probably gone on a lot in this video and it's long so <laughs> I might finish it up there. And I will leave links so that everyone can read for themselves what's on here. But um, I think it's very interesting that at the beginning of December, like I've seen frequently on the OSTF, all these people that feel the need to defend Mark McMurtry. The thing is, you know, an honest man doesn't need any defence. And yet there's so many rushing to his defence. I don't need anybody to defend me. I speak for myself and if anyone's got a problem with that, I'm quite happy you know, to engage them. Some might not be happy with what they get, but hey, you know, that's what you get. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to leave it at that. I think I've given people enough to think about in that uh, there's so much criminal activity. Now I have to tell you that Adrian Brannock in his breaches in the Bankruptcy Act is a crime. These are criminal activities. And those that are around him in the community that helped him move all his shares and his directorships at the time actually helped him conceal those shares from his creditor. They participated in criminal activity. But there's a really big problem for them too because Adrian Brannock's creditor is a Commonwealth entity and the conspiracy to defraud a Commonwealth entity. Well, let's just say there are other names to call it if you're not a Commonwealth entity, but if you are, it's called conspiracy to defraud and that's what all of you that moved shares around moved directorships in compliance and aided and abetted Adrian Brannock to conceal those shares from his bankruptcy from his creditor and then also knowing that after that he has also continued to benefit through his transference of the shares of Nyepi into his wife's name and he still promotes the nightcap as a developer. We own it. I own it. This is all mine. Ours. How does he get part of a $36 million project, be a bankrupt, be a developer, I could bring in the other links and refresh people about the Voxes. Well, hang on. Better still, I'll use my Not A Real Name channel for um, yeah, easy reference. It's on this browser. So one of my skills is fucking people over the Adrian Brennox Vox. And given that I'm a predatory cunt, and I mean that as a term of endearment. <laughs> yeah, let's just remind. And how he also got those deleted as claims as defamation. They cannot be defamation when it comes out of your own damn mouth. And what? Are you saying you were lying in those videos, in those voxes, Adrian Brannock? That's not, not what you said? You were lying? I'm sorry, but you did say it. So, you know, you said it. It's the way you are. And it is a true confession. <laughs> yeah.
He really have stuffed up. And as far as Mark McMurtry goes, I mean, seriously, how many um, elder tribal elder names and everything can he come up with? There's four so far. And for someone that actually didn't have any bloodline connection, then has a bloodline connection, but now that does, you know, that bloodline connection wasn't very strong. That's why he had to go and get adopted into another tribe so that he could have an adopted bloodline connection that was more real than his apparent bloodline connection. Yeah. You know what? It's just like any actor. They take on a character. It's not them. It's just the character they play. And I think it's time that a lot of tribal communities that are sucked in by this OSTF actually woke up to the fact that Mark McMurtry is nothing more than an actor. A character that he plays is the one that he comes and cons you with. I'm not going to give him his tribal name because you know what? He doesn't deserve it. I know what he does deserve. It's a nice little room with a few bars, regular exercise, set meals. Oh, and guess what? No bloody sovereignty or freedom. And you don't get to dictate to other people how they're supposed to think and achieve sovereignty. I, you know, I get really touchy over these sovereignty issues because... They are a load of bullshit. The way I look at it is that they're trying to convince me to go out and try and get something I already have. You know, it's like they tell me that I've got a birth certificate and because I've got a birth certificate, I'm now two people. Um, no. <laughs> Still just me. Do I have any control? Am I a slave? Well, let me see. All the mistakes I've ever made in my life, I made them. All the things I ever succeeded at, I did that. Um, are there limits in society? Oh, shit, sure. There are for everybody. We all live under basic guidelines. We call them laws and rules. And, you know, you always got those that want to set up apart from it and yet still milk the system that they never contribute to. Because that's another thing with these sovereignty things. They are basically just a tax dodge. They all get done on tax evasion because that's what they're ultimately setting up. I want to earn money and not give anything back. Now, like it or lump it, I don't like it. I don't think anyone does like taxes. But I also accept that some things are necessary. Without taxes, how would we have hospitals? How would we look after the elderly? How would we look after the disabled? How would we look after the homeless, the hungry? How would we build roads? How would we do anything? No, there is a simple, basic, common way that we have done everything in society up until this point. Yes, we can change the way all of us do it. But the way they want to set up, they don't want to pay any taxes. They don't want to contribute to any of the well-being of the rest of community. But if they had an accident, they'll go down and they'll use their Medicare card. And that's your taxes that have paid for that, not theirs. They refuse to get a driver's license. You know that your driver's license carries compulsory third-party insurance. You also know that if they cause an accident without a valid Australian driver's license, insurance is invalid. And what if they hurt somebody? And can they hurt somebody? Well, I read an article. Oh, hang on. I've got it up here. Free man on the land walks out on his own trial, claims it isn't him being accused. What this guy does is a hit and run. And he leaves hurt people 
and drives off. He had a cop chase him down. He did a runner. Then when he finally gets caught and put into court, he's in there and saying, that's not me. I'm a legal person and a living person. That's a dead one and, you know, that's not me. I don't belong to that. And he walks out of the courtroom. And you know what good that did him? Guess what? He was still charged and found guilty and and made it even worse for himself that, seriously, how can anyone have the arrogance to damage someone else's property, and I think it was about five or six thousand dollars worth of damage to the property, damage other people's property, damage other people, and then just drive off and leave them, and then say, oh, it wasn't him, it's not my fault. This is the kind of arrogance behind the thinking. They've got the gall. So, yeah, most of these, um, Mark McMurtry, I dare say, well, he has. He's been to court because he doesn't hold a, a driver's licence. Max Egan does exactly the same thing. How many of them don't have a driver's licence? But yes, Max Egan did hurt himself and he ended up at the hospital. And I guarantee you, it was his Medicare card that paid for that. Wasn't all his tax-free donations. <laughs> it was other taxpayers' money. And Max Egan's made it quite clear. He's never voted and he's never paid taxes. So as far as I'm concerned, Max Egan is not entitled to Medicare and he's not entitled to any of the other benefits that people that contribute to the whole of society. Now, you look at it, especially in 2020. There's, look, there are more unemployed people than there are jobs to fill them. This was before 2020. And the distribution of wealth amongst those that can earn a money, we call it tax. Yeah, fair enough, there's the elite that are filthy rich. And seriously, I think if both, well, if the Queen, Oprah and the Pope gave over all the wealth they had to pay off the world's debts, the world's problems would be solved overnight. So, you know, I'm not... <laughs> I appreciate the situation that we all find ourselves in. Because, yeah, I'm like everybody. I'm busted ass broke with not a thing to my name. So when you've got these little, <laughs> these little, uh, yeah, heroes that want to come against you and go, oh, we're going to take you for everything you've got. It's like, yeah, well, good luck with that. What would you like? <laughs> Because, you know, you can't get blood from a stone. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. And I'll catch you on the next one.